Today we had the DHSS Summit where we focused on provider and hospital leadership issues. We had a great conversation with five speakers and they spoke about a range of experiences that they had from places all over the country. We also had a wonderful audience here with over 100 in-person attendees and many more online. So we're looking forward to sharing a little bit about the points that we heard from each of our speakers. Last year, Jess Jacobs, the head of innovation at Aetna, blogged about her care experience with two rare diseases. Jess is trained as a Green Belt Six Sigma, so she would write about a 12-hour wait in the emergency room as having 7% process cycle efficiency. Over the course of a year, she documented 56 outpatient doctor visits of which 29% were useful, 20 visits to the ER, and 54 days as an inpatient across nine hospital admissions. Her calculations showed that only 0.08% of that time was spent treating her condition. For her, time saved equates to quality. Speed is quality. And in healthcare, we deliver very little quality when defined by a metric that matters to our patients, their own time. How did we get here? Well, I like to say that in the United States, we have a perfectly designed $3 trillion healthcare delivery system. It's perfectly designed to deliver more and more healthcare. It's not designed to deliver more and more health. But what do people want? Health, not health care. But I think that this last piece was a thing that really sort of sealed the deal for us. I mean, we are a physician-owned, physician-governed organization. Our board of directors meets once a month at night because everybody on the board except me is a full-time practicing doc. And we said, hey, look, our best path to financial success is going to be, is going to be in these new models is to take the best care possible of our sickest patients to offer them an array of services, the likes of which they have never seen before. Because we believe that we could reduce total cost of care in that way by taking better care of those sickest people, and I'll get back to that. But that really sort of hit the values uh, of our organization, and so we said, well, I think we've got the right environment, we've got a bunch of the pieces, uh, this resonates with our values, so we're gonna do it. And then we also decided right from the outset that we're going all in. We had, a, um, we had a year where Blue Cross, and credit to them, were the first ones that were giving us stipends for nurse care managers in our patient-centered medical homes. I was still practicing primary care then. And so you would have these experiences where you have a patient who you're thinking is kind of marginal. Do I need to send them to the ED to be admitted? Could we manage them at home? And then you're thinking, well, if I want to manage them at home, I need to get, um, I need to get them a dose of ID antibiotics and a breathing treatment. I need to make sure a nurse sees them at home today. Let's say it's a COPD exacerbation in a patient, uh, probably provoked by pneumonia, but you're thinking you might not have to send them to the hospital, but boy, we've got a lot of work to do. And I've got this nurse care manager 20 feet away who could set this all up for me, except they're only for Blue Cross patients, right? So we thought, well, that doesn't work for us. So if we're going to do this new model of care, uh, we're going to go all in. We also thought, boy, we're going to need a lot of resources to do this effectively, and if we only do it with a single payer and, and we just stick a toe in the water, you know, we're never going to make enough, we're not going to move the needle and be able to actually get a return on this investment. So we decided, based on wanting to have one standard of care that, um, and to make this economically viable, that we were going to go all in from the beginning, Fast forward to 2014, the state of Maryland decided while we were doing well, we weren't doing well enough. And we needed to have the first modification of the waiver or the first new waiver. And here's the Medicare per capita spend that you see. We were number four in the nation. But in Delaware, you guys were 10, so in the top 10, we were all busting the, the average. And so the new waiver was effective in January of 2014. It was designed for a five-year term. And it really did establish a very hard revenue cap, so it truly fixed the budgets and fixed the revenue to a certain rate. And there are different factors that go into it. 
Um, I was told, you know, they always have saying, hey, if you just do the math, I was told not to try to do the math because the math is fuzzy. There are all kinds of analysts who are paid to do the math when it comes to figuring out um, the wavering. It was designed to generate over a five-year period, $300 million in savings. In the first two years, this waiver generated $280 million in savings, and we we're en route to saving $500 million at the end of that five year. Um, we'll talk about the rewards and penalties because there are a lot of them built into the system. And now, a new wrinkle coming into waiver 2.0, by 2017, we had to be able to address how hospitals would take the responsibility for the total cost of care in the state. And we had to choose one of two demonstrations to do, either HSIP or CSIP, which is Hospital Care uh, Improvement Program or the Community Care Improvement Program by partnering with community physicians. Much like Delaware, Maryland still has a predominance of small practices, small group practices, and larger groups not affiliated necessarily with the hospital. Of those 1,500 physicians that I have affiliated with my hospital, we actually own only 12, employ 12. I am one of those 12. Everyone else is an affiliate and a partner. So trying to say that we now have responsibility for those physicians and how they practice to keep the total cost of care down puts an extreme burden um, on the hospital system. So in with primary care, we developed a network of practices and with these practices, we started off with paying additional $2 per member per month for participation. One of the problems that I see happening with pay for performance or pay, payment for quality metrics, as you said as an ACO, is that the bar starts way too high because practices want to do the right thing, but to make a series of 10 metrics right off the start is not something that they're able to do. And if you're going to really engage practices in changing from encounter-based to population-based payment, you have to start at the very beginning. So we started with attribution. For that $2 per member per month, what we asked our practices to do was meet with us every three months. We would come out, spend a half hour with them, and um, we would go over their data with them. So we would show them, first of all, attribution. Who does Medicaid say is your patient? Who is really your patient? And, and really important to be able to do this because this is where you, you find your gaps in care. So a lot of kids who have Medicaid don't make it to the doctor for well visits. They don't make it to the doctor for needed care. And one of the big things we could be doing as an accountable care organization for pediatrics and Medicaid, just making sure the kids get in for the care that they need. So this slide, I, I really think that, you know, and Secretary Odenwalker talks about these issues all the time. You know, if your refrigerator's broken and you can't afford to refit your refrigerator, how are you gonna keep your insulin from going bad? Or, you know, if you're supposed to eat a healthy diet because you're now diabetic and you live in a food desert, how's that gonna happen? So this, this is a heavy lift. I mean, the type of work that we have to do as a state is really heavy, and it's not just on healthcare providers, it's not just on the state, it's, it's not just on patients, you know, it's, it's really all of us. If we're going to lower costs, we need to improve health. And this is a partnership, it's really state government, it's hospitals and providers, it's our patients, it's our payers, and it's a, really our community. You know, we're, this is all about this concept of a healthcare cost benchmark, and I think that we have to understand that we have an avalanche of chronic disease coming our way. Um, if you look at the obesity rates of children, those children are going to become diabetic. I think diabetes is the precursor to all other diseases, because it is. And diabetes is very challenging to manage as an individual, um, but it's your blood sugar, making sure you get your eye exams, making sure that, you know, you, you, you keep your hemoglobin A1C, you explain that to a person in control, um, taking multiple medications. So we have an avalanche coming our way, and we don't really know the cost that's going to be here, not necessarily in five years or ten years. We're attracting older people to Delaware. They love to retire here, which is awesome, but older people then come with chronic disease. So I hope as we go forward in doing this work, you know, that our measure isn't about how much it costs, you know, for you know, an amputation. I hope that we're 
Our measure is how many amputations never occur because there's diabetics are under control. Or how much does it cost to do dialysis in a facility versus home dialysis? It really is about not having anybody on dialysis. You know, or how many NICU days, the length of stay, or the cost per day. It really is about, let's empty the NICU. So I think if we keep that as our focus, that if we improve health, we absolutely will lower costs. That's the goal. I think you know we're going to get to the answer that we need to get to in doing this type of uh, payment reform. So we had a great session today. I certainly heard from both audience members and from the speakers that Delaware can take this issue on and we need the healthcare community to come together to define how we want to approach population health and also get to a place where we have better patient experience and better cost. If we take it in as a whole, we can get there. I hope all of you will also join us on Monday. We're having another conversation about some of the legal and regulatory implications and approaches and lessons learned from the Massachusetts experience. Senator Brian Townsend will be our host and moderator, and we're going to be at the Stanton campus of Dell Tech at 10 a.m. this Monday, September 25th. Hope to see you there. Join us online or in person.